morning. We are 8 o'clock, Thursday morning. Not so many people here this morning yet. Good, good, good. Have a quiet one today. Get a chance to get some work done. Speaking of work done, I got lots done yesterday. I spent almost the whole day at this. It's way different from when you saw it last time to show. Look at this, look at this, look at this. All the grass is finished. The tree is finished at the bottom here. And I cleared out a bunch of the unneeded parts of the bird bodies. Here's the model. Hey, there are birds here, but the bodies of the birds, the bodies of the birds are not going to appear on this block. They're going to be on another block. He turned his motor off. Good, thank you, thank you. From the birds, what will appear on this block are the eyes, the beaks, and the legs. All the feathers on the bodies will be on a separate block. They will be cut as it is, just embossed. So if we zoom in a bit here, oops. We zoom in with the first bird up here. Where is it? Here we are. There's a bird here. You can see the legs and feet are carved. The body was here, it's gone. And the eye and beak are here. The body was in this area. This next one, the head is here. And the legs are where is it? Down, down here, I guess. Another one. So there's uh, another head here. So we're chewing away. Now we're not going to be finished this morning, but we are now getting close. We're now getting close. I won't have time to work on this all the rest of today. It's going to be work on the New Year's design the rest of today. But uh, And then after the birds are done, it'll be the calligraphy, which will be a day's work. And then we're up and running. So let's get at it. It looks darker than usual down here today. I wonder why. What's going on? Is the light? It's okay, I guess. Okay, paper is out upstairs. One package of paper is out from Ishikawa Sam. And as far as show and tell goes, we have, <laughs> with show and tell, I have good news and bad news. It depends if your name is Tom1060. I prepared the folder. At the end of last stream, in order that I wouldn't try and remember, I prepared the folder with the crab print in it. It's been sitting here on the shelf since the end, uh, an hour or so after the end of the last stream. It was the plan this morning. But but, but, last night we got sideswiped by something much more interesting. Ishikawa-san brought something last night, which we will be showing this morning on the show and tell. Live, new woodblock prints. So the crabs are here, the crabs are here, but, uh... <laughs> Maybe if it's time we'll look at both, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, they're here, they're here. Yes, we're talking about Ichikawa-san's book, that's right. So she brought me the other day, last night, she brought me some samples of all the books she's made. It's now six. She's working on the sixth book, and I have four of them here this morning. I have four of her books, handmade books. They'll be on the show and tell this morning. So instead of old junk this morning, it's going to be new stuff. So I guess I can show, a, it's not a tease, I can show. And I'll, after she brought the books last night, she also brought something else, which I didn't know she had had. I knew she's been making these handmade books, carving and printing every single page, printing them up, binding them with thread, and making a few copies for her family. But we'd asked her years ago, you know, how can we get these things? You know, and she says, well, I'm not going to become a bookmaker, you know, whatever. She just made them for her own pleasure. But after four of them were finished, she contacted... Uh, uh, whatever, a printing company, and gave them the samples, and they made an actual book, you know, an offset printed book out of her handmade books. And she brought one of those last night, so I'm like, I know what I can do with this. So within minutes, within seconds, within minutes, I had it up on the catalog. So this is a, uh, there's an image, that's her printed book, and it shows you the books we will be looking at in the show and tell today.
and actually she's upstairs now. And I, when she came in this morning, I said, come on, we're going to talk about your books around 9.15. Come on down. She's like, no, 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 no. She won't do it because she thinks it's like self-promotion. And I'm like, it's just showing people fun stuff. But she's like, no, 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 no. So we're going to see her talking about her books, and she's upstairs, uh, upstairs printing. Okay, let's get some work done. These are crane legs, crane legs, full of knots and, and curves and, and joints. And, uh, That was not so bad. Peace and quiet again. Next interruption will be the garbage truck, right? Or maybe the vacuum ladies, who knows? That was the delivery of Oshibori, the small towels. It's a rental company. They rent the towels to different restaurants and bars who serve them to customers and take back you know, the, the towels. And this company picks up the dirty ones and delivers clean wrapped ones. So. What's the question? Supply chain was not broken. I could get better quality wood. Is it because trees are rare? No, I know. No, this is something we've, we've, we've touched on many, many times. I know our supply problems these days, the reason we can't get good wood for, for whatever purposes, is not because of uh, over usage of the resource. It's, you know, like, like fish or, or something like this. It's because not enough usage of the resource. Uh, because so few people are interested in these particular products, this particular kind of wood for carving, because the market doesn't exist, then because of that, the supply chain disappeared. People cannot go out up to the woods and cut the trees if nobody wants to buy them. So the trees are still there. This was a natural harvest. They weren't trees from a tree farm like, like uh, most Japanese lumber and timber. This was natural harvesting. And once the market disappeared, the people that prepared the product also disappeared, moved on to other things. So, so the frustrating part is the trees are there up in the mountains. But identifying a particular tree that will be good for us and putting it through the process of buying it, arranging with a landowner, 
cutting it, moving it into a storage location, treating it properly over the period of five, six, seven, or eight years that's necessary to dry it and get it ready, and then slice it up in a particular method that suits our work. There's just so many variables along the way. And because there are so few customers, there are no longer people providing those services. So, so we're trying to do it ourselves. But we just don't have the expertise. And also the, the knowledge of how to put all the pieces together over a period of six, seven, eight years. I get the viewpoint there's a lot of people who hear us talk about the wood and who will make suggestions like, well, there's lots of different kinds of wood in the world, you know, there's thousands of different kinds of wood. Surely something else must be useful, you know. And I myself, too, back before I got immersed in this for decades, I would have said exactly the same thing. Well, wood is wood, you know, find a hard piece of wood, you're okay, you're good to go with it. But the requirements, it's, it's sort of, the requirements are just so strict, you know. Even cherry wood itself, we're using Yamazakura, mountain cherry. And of course, once we couldn't get that, we started getting other kinds of cherry. We tried a Yoshino sakura, or just a normal sakura. And actually, it doesn't work. It sort of works. It's here, and you can cut it, and you can chop away it, and you can make shapes. But when you come time to print it, because the pattern of, of cellular structure on the wood is different, the printed image looks completely different. You can see the striations in the color from where the, the pores are in the wood. So there was a reason the old guys used Yamazakura rather than normal cherry sakura for a specific result. And, and here at Mokahanka, our particular quirk on it is that we really, really, really like to make prints as closely as possible to the old days. And it turns out that it's just not a random deal. If you want the prints to look, to have the same look and feel as those old prints did, then yes, it's a question of using the same materials, you know, prepared the same way. So, so for modern printmakers, yeah, wood, any kind of wood, go get it, go for it, whatever. But uh, for our specific requirements, it's not so easy. That's why as much as possible, we're reusing old wood. What I'm carving right now today is an old piece of wood that's been planed down and repurposed. You know. My own camera, it's okay to show. Hi. There's a message being held here. That's another one of our test of Twitch. There's a message being held. It's from Shweezy Peasy, who has been typing here, right? Shweezy Peasy typed a message that's been held. I'm now going to allow it. Allowed. And Shweezy Peasy said, ho. I'll leave that with no comment. Time to start a tree sanctuary. It's not relevant. The trees are there. The trees are there already. It's a question of finding them, identifying them, like I said, cutting them, getting to Tokyo, putting them for a half a year in the salt water, bringing them out, slicing them a certain way, slicing them another certain way that's all different from everybody else. It just Am I too quiet? The microphone is here. We were trying to avoid stomach noises. Audio settings are the same, but I put the mic under my chin here instead of near my stomach.
can feel the action down there. I'm glad I moved the microphone, I think, because uh, there'd be lots of complaints if I hadn't. <laughs> I did have breakfast this morning, but I just stuffed it down a few minutes before the start of the stream, so I know. I can't wait, you know. If I don't eat, it's noisy. If I eat an hour before, it's noisy. If I just stuff it down quickly before the stream, it's noisy, so I don't know. <laughs> can't be helped. Can't be helped. of chameleon oil there, eh? It wasn't quite visible where the stuff was, but just a light, tiny touch of oil on the top of the block. And right away, everything becomes perfectly clear. The last remnants of the paper that were on the wood there become uh, transparent, so. And also, too, you know, there are carvers. I, I don't do this so much myself, but there are carvers who put a little dab of oil on the wood before they start carving, and it, it's, you know, it actually helps the knife slide around a little bit. I don't, uh, no, I don't really do that so much, but uh, Askasan does it. Does, you know. Even when it's not a visibility question, he puts a little bit of oil on the surface of the wood. And, uh, Most of you already know the, the print we're carving now here. This is going to be the first print in next year's subscription series. And uh, yesterday, Aoyama-san and I and Cameron via, via video camera, we had a sort of a conference about this, and we have some real problems coming up for next year's series. I know, I mean, we're going to make prints. The prints are okay, but we have some real issues in getting organized. We have to decide the price of the prints. We are have to decide the postage costs. And at the moment, we are totally hamstrung because we're not able to decide either of those things because there's too many variable factors that are uh, still up in the air. The Americans have set new rules for incoming packages as of January the 1st. And this was announced quite a long time ago, uh, within a year ago or, or maybe even up to two years ago, I'm not quite sure. They have something called the STOP Act, S-T-O-P. I don't remember what it stands for, but the point being, it's all part of their, uh, the thing that's been going on for, for uh, 10 years in America, the, the anti-terrorism thing. And it, the STOP Act is saying, among many other things, that every package that is coming into America via the post office or FedEx or whatever, the contents have to be announced and declared before the package leaves the originating country. Up to now, whatever, the Japanese post office prepares a bag full of stuff with American addresses on, sends it to America. The American post office receives it, looks at the addresses, and delivers it. And, you know, whatever customs stuff has to go on. They're not doing that anymore from January. Every single piece of goods, every single package, has to be electronically first declared. The, the originating post office or whatever, or, or freight company, has to send an electronic notification, invoice and contents and all that kind of stuff. The American side says, no, we don't want that, or yes, we'll accept this, or away you go. And then once that this acceptance has come, then they're allowed to put it on an airplane and send it over. And one of the downsides of this is that a normal person walking to their post office here in Japan would take a package they're going to send to America for some reason, write the label on it, uh, Jed Henry, address, 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 and put it in the mailbox. The Japanese post office has no way to send that information across to America. So from January 1st, and this has already pretty much been implemented already in early in advance, from January 1st, no packages are going to be accepted for America with handwritten or hand-typed or consumer-prepared address labels. What you have to do is you have to log on to the Japanese post office website, 
type in all the details of the stuff, who you are, what the package is, where it's going, blah, 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 blah. Get a registered number, get a barcode and all that kind of stuff in your, in your smartphone app. When you get to the post office with your package, which has no address on it, you then beep your smartphone app on a barcode reader, blah, blah, blah. The post office machine prints out a label and it goes on the package and away you go. And of course, because you typed in the data in advance, the data has been sent through for all this customs clearance, blah, blah, blah. So it seems okay. We don't actually handwrite our addresses anyway. We print them from our computer. Unfortunately, the Japanese post office doesn't accept this. They have a system where you log into what's called the My Page, and one by one by one, you type in all the addresses. And we cannot type in all the addresses one by one by one for sometimes hundreds of, hundreds of packages per day. They do have a system in place for businesses, for Amazon or whatever, to do this. And guess what? The, the software is only for Windows computers. And all of our software is completely custom software. I wrote, and I wrote it for Mac OS. So we've been wrestling with this, and it's still not finished, how to get our own software system combined with the post office software system. And we're still not even close, not even close. And then on top of that, another factor is the post office is changing the different types of mail they allow to be carried. They had things like air mail, small packet, ELS, blah, blah, blah. And they're now changing. Small packet is actually going to disappear. It's going to be replaced with what they call e-packet and e-packet light. And another factor, we mentioned this before, the postal, international postal negotiations have been going on and the American negotiators have really put their feet down and the overseas prices that we are going to pay from next year are going to be much higher for the U.S. than for any other country. So before we've had a standard overseas price for our subscription prints, it's been like $3.50 per month or in euros or pounds, whatever, but the same number. About three fifty per month for a subscription print. And from now on, that will be marginally okay for Germany, but America is going to be five times that price. So we're having to rebuild all of our systems and our shopping carts to, so that if you're in America, you have to put in your address first before you see the shopping cart, and the shipping price will be four or five times higher. And this is going to have some impact on our subscriptions, obviously. Five times higher from, from next year. Seems okay, eh? Bird legs. <clears throat> yeah, Mike Hex's guy, we're doing it. We're gonna have our Mac software spit out CSVs. This is exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna spit out CSVs. Cameron's got a Windows laptop and we're gonna up upload them from there. So this is this is the solution. And no price for the subscription prints, and yet uh, there's another factor involved, and that's the US dollar Japanese yen rate. Because we keep the price for the prints set for one year, we do, what do they call it, price protection. We set the price for a subscription. We set it in December for next year's series, January to December. And we do not want to change it. We want to guarantee you, here's the price, sign up. We're not going to double the price three months later. But there's exchange rates, US, Japanese yen exchange rates. So we've got to set the price in December for the next year at a rate where if the exchange rate does fluctuate a bit, it will still be okay. And right now, with the American election coming up next week, and then who knows what's going to happen for the next few months until the inauguration, we can't choose the price because we have no idea what's going to happen to the U.S. dollar. 
We have no idea, no idea. Could offer a shipping schedule. Yes, this is going to be part of it too. Because of these shipping prices going up dramatically, we are going to re redo the whole way we run the software on this. And many, many people are, are clearly going to ask us, look, ship once every three months or, or whatever. Another thing we are planning is continuing what we're doing now, shipping in bulk by FedEx to an American drop-off. So we then use, <coughs> excuse me, so we then use local U.S. postage rather than international postage. But then these are all things I said we're still figuring out what to do, but this is why we are not ready yet to make an announcement for next year's series. There are still way, way too many unknown factors. The print price itself, the raw print price itself is probably not going to change. Even though the prints are larger and have much more delicate carving, the print price itself, our current guess, is that it won't change. Postage will be higher and our exchange rate may have to be more. But it's still, at, at here at the end of October, it's still too soon to call. The CSV thing too, we, we, I knew this was going to happen, but it, it, you know, when it finally happened, I'm just like, give me a break. We got the information from the post office on their API and what, uh, what format they want this data in. And actually, it's not clear. They keep changing the rules on it because they're still formulating this themselves. But we did. We got the thing for the CSV. I did a sample printout for my software, sent it over to camera, and he put it, it doesn't work. It turns out that I'm using this strange idea. I'm putting my software all this in what's called UTF-8. Kind of a bizarre idea, right? <laughs> because the post office is using Shift-JIS. <laughs> Give me a break! Oh! And then byte order mark at the beginning of the CSV file. If it's backwards, little endian, big endian. Just, I don't want to talk about Windows. I don't want to talk about Windows. Greek, yeah. I, 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 can, I can understand why they're doing that, why their system is shift JIS, and it's a single word, it's legacy. They built their software in the pre-UTFA era. They built it only for Japanese, a large Japanese corporation built software running for the Japanese language. It makes sense, I, you know, whatever. There was no such thing as the internationalization wasn't a big deal back then. You've got an organization like the post office now, which has massive, massive computer systems in place. So I understand why they're doing this. It's legacy. They cannot rebuild all their systems. But when someone like me, who has a relatively modern system now, UTF-8, of course, is the international standard for character sets. Nobody would ever dream of using anything else for any kind of a new system now. So I get it. I understand it. I've got my own legacy problems in software too, so I understand how that works, but uh, it's frustrating nonetheless. So. Chicken feet, it's like chicken feet. They show all these things. They're cranes, not chickens, but they look like chicken feet.
<laughs> outside mic off. The outside mic is on. I think it's a very quiet day out there. That's all. The outside mic is on at its normal level. Is the mug in use? Yes, the mug is in use. Did I get, but I got a couple of problems with the mug. It's right here. I used it again yesterday. But there's a couple of problems with the mug. One is it's way too big. This is a giant mug. I know. Oh my God. Normally, I would drink about maybe half that much. As, as I showed you today, I put two of those packets of coffee in there. The other problem with this mug, and this is why I'm probably not going to use it every day all the time, is not only is it hugely big, it's wide open, it's ceramic, you pour your coffee in, and 30 seconds later, it's, it's not cold, but 30 seconds later, it's, it's already started to go, to, to go you know, not so hot. Normally, I use, I use this thing which is about half the volume, and it's one of those, you know, it's got a, a thermal, little thermal thing in. So when you pour your coffee in, it sort of stays warm for, for quite a long time. I mean, we know that's why. I mean, it needs the heat to make the picture, so of course the coffee becomes cooler. So, so it's nice, it's fun, and I will, it'll be here, and I'll use it now and then, but it's not gonna be my daily routine. Carving here, you know, you get a cup of coffee, put it down, carve, and it'll be five, 10 minutes, and then come back and sip something. Five or 10 minutes, come back and sip something. And with this big mug, it's game over. It's game over. I didn't dishwash it. No, of course not, of course not. Shift JS, Mojibaki nightmare. Yes, so, 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 so. This man has some experience here. I was in a good mood. Don't set me off in a bad mood. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> the nightmares. When I set up my first website in Japanese, this would be back in like 1996, you know. I was building it here on my Mac, which at that time, it, at that time was a Shift GIS Mac, so that was okay. But the website was hosted on a server in Pittsburgh. We are still out. We, we use pair networks for all of our hosting. And back then they were running, you know, I forget, it was uh, PHP level 3.7 or something ridiculous, something archaic. And it didn't understand you know, anything except ASCII characters at all. So the nightmares of trying to run a Japanese language website on a server that didn't understand Japanese, you know. We used, what was it called? It was MB... Multi-byte, I forget that the, we had an extension onto our PHP files. Yeah. My God, the hours and hours and hours and hours I wasted on that stuff. It's hard to believe in how software like that, PHP, only understood ASCII characters. You know, it was incredible. So when the, the UTF-8 uh, world came along, well, I just grabbed onto it with both hands. It just saved my life.
timer okay, no problem. Raiders, people visiting, hello, hello, visitors, welcome. How did I learn about web development stuff? Whatever, my, my computer experience goes back way before that. I know, I have no professional, I know, I'm, I haven't, I've never been to college and stuff like that about this, but uh, when I was working at the music store in Toronto in the mid 1970s, I got interested in this. This was before, you know, before, what did we call them, microcomputers, before microcomputers came up. I was interested in this, so I, I found a timeshare company and I rented, I rented a, a, what do you call it, a dumb terminal. Had it in my office at the music store with an acoustic coupler, you know, one of those uh, handsets you put on top of your telephone. And that gave me access to a PDP-7 machine in an office downtown. And a couple of nights a week, I went down there to the office themselves, actually, to chat with the guys and see what's going on. And the other evenings in the week, I just practiced and uh, worked out stuff through the, through the, uh, through the dumb terminal. And the guys at the company, it was called you know, HCR, Human Computing Resources. They had this PDP-7, and I think they had a PDP-11 in the next room. And they had a bright idea. They would, they would get this thing, a place called Dartmouth College had developed a new language they called BASIC. And these guys at this place in Toronto were building a version of this BASIC for the PDP systems, thinking that they would sell it to all the different colleges and places that had, uh, that had these PDP computers. PDP sevens. So I was, uh, on a, I was, on a, I was paying my own way there. I was renting this terminal just to practice and learn myself and do assembler and stuff. But I signed on with them as being their number one tester. So they're building this language. They we're going to call it whatever, basic for, for PDP seven. And I was their number one tester. This would be 1976 or something like that. 76, 77. I don't remember. 76 or 77. So each evening from, from my office, I'd stay late in my office, fire up this, this thing, and log on to this computer, and practice writing programs for it. So my, my, my knowledge of, com of computer science and stuff is zero, it's just whatever. And then along after that, along came the, the microcomputer era and Byte magazine and stuff like that, and the Altair computer. I never bought one of those. The first computer I bought was, uh, a, it was a Commodore, what was it called, a Commodore 8032. And we used that in the music store. I wrote software for it that controlled our musical instrument rental system. And what a machine it was, you know. There's no mouse, nothing like that. This is before those were, were invented. We had twin floppy drives. Each one would hold like 500K of data. Fabulous, fabulous stuff. I remember getting that drive, you know, a double disk drive with double floppies, 500K on each one, and my God, look at all that space. It's a question of life chances not taken. You know, there, you know, we talk about the roads we don't take and stuff. When I was doing that, testing that software for those guys at HCR, what I tried to do was I tried to think of a general application that would test this stuff. So I made a little program in their rudimentary basic that would allow a user to set up his own little database. The user would say, okay, I want 10 fields here. 
the name, the address, blah, 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 blah. And the user would set these 10 fields and my software would then write a little table into a, this was all text files, this wasn't a database, this was text files in the background. So the user could then set his database first and then start putting in data for it and then search for name and search for stuff like this. And this is 1977 or whatever, I'm doing this. And if I had stayed with that, if I'd stayed with that, I quit and went back to the music store and all that kind of stuff. But if I'd stayed with that, there I am developing a rudimentary self-user database in 1977. Oh, the life choices, if I had gone that way instead, you know, I would have been competing with Oracle or something or whatever. We had a Commodore 64. Yeah, this is the year I'm in, is way before that. Commodore 64 was when they went into game machines. This was on all, no, I didn't invent the basic. I was their tester. These two guys were writing the assembler to build the basic in the background. And I was their uh, sample user. So out the front, I was using this to show them, hey, this doesn't work, this works, this doesn't work, this works. I had nothing to do with, with writing it. Commodore Pet, so, so. Pet, I think Pet was the very first one. That was the one with the chiclet keyboard. Then they brought out a business machine. This was Commodore, I think in Germany, and then it was sold in Canada. I don't think it was ever sold in America. I'm not really sure. Yeah, the Bill Gates quote, to show you don't need more than 512K. <laughs> I've been there, I've been there. Bill stayed with it, I didn't, and look at the difference in our lives. <laughs> so... <laughs> After Commodore went to Radio Shack, that would have been the TRS-80 to show Radio Shack had the TRS-80. So Lotus 1, 2, 3 by Dave. You laugh, but that would have been my life, you know. The thing is, though, I would never have been able to handle the business aspect of it. I could have coded and stuff like that, but I would have been destroyed business-wise. I would have been destroyed. I never, I couldn't, you know, I joke about this. I could have been a Bill Gates. No, I couldn't have, because I could never have done the business side of it that those guys did, you know. But I should have stayed with programming. That was the era to do that, you know. The funny thing, the other day I was talking to Aoi Amazon about this, you know, I brought, took the matinee. We found this in the files here. This is the irrelevant to our carving today. Sorry, sidetrack here. It's the Commodore Microcomputer Magazine. And it's volume four. And there's no date on it, actually. They made magazines with no freaking dates. It's got the information here, but no dates. And I was a contributor to their column, a user department column for PET CBM. And I dug this out and it's still here. And here's, it's, uh, I did a series for them in the user departments, the stories by Dave Bull. And it's programming uh, no, people who were buying these Commodore computers. It's, uh, here's what you do, how do you do this? This particular story is, there's no clear screen command on that computer. So when you're using it for business, you write data on it, it just works like a glass teletype, and that's not what you want to do when you're a user, type in your name address on a form. So there was no clear screen command on the computer. So I wrote one. I wrote one, and it's in, it's in assembler here, and I cannot understand this now. An assembler program, I wrote this for this thing, and you, you did what? You poked it into user, user RAM up at the top there. And then I ran a test program that tested how fast it worked and stuff like this. So I wrote this column for this magazine. And this is 19, whatever, 19, that's about 1980 by then or something. I don't know. So these are probably online, actually. Somebody has probably scanned these. The Commodore Microcomputer Magazine. And I did a bunch of their columns for them in, in 1979 or 80 or whatever. But looking on it now, I, I, I can't understand the assembler anymore. I haven't worked in assembler for 40 years. So I can't read that code and understand it now. But anyway, that's where you got to start. If you get your start in stuff like that, then writing these days, writing, using a lap stack to write stuff for, for the web now, it's, it's, I'm sorry, now it's a piece of cake. These days, nothing, you know. Back when I was a kid, you know, in, Nowadays, all the frameworks and stuff make life so easy as, a, as an application programmer, you know, nothing. But back then, to write an application program, you needed a simpler, you know.
whatever, carving chicken feet and talking about assembler programs. If this isn't kind of an offbeat twitch dream, I don't know what is, but whatever. I, I left that whole world, you know, when we moved to Japan here in 1986. I left the music company. That's when I left uh, the programming and stuff behind. And I didn't, uh, didn't have a computer. We just, it wasn't part of my life at all. I came here to do woodblock printmaking. It was a conscious choice not to muck with that stuff. I didn't buy a computer. And we picked up our next computer in, it would be 1996, this so when we, we moved here in 1986, so that was, so I went so 10 years, 1986 to 1996, when I had nothing to do with computers or programming or anything. And then I had just seen around the middle 1990s, 1995 and six, there were just so many stories in the newspaper and magazines. There was this new thing called the internet. And I had no idea what was going on because in my era of computers, there'd been nothing like networking or anything like this. So. So come 1996, my kids had left to go to school in Canada, and I'm there by myself, and I thought, okay, let's, uh, I've heard about this internet thing that's happening, let's have a look at this. So I bought whatever was the local, the current, I don't know, Apple computer in those days, I think it was an L LC520 or something, I can't remember. And built a website and went from there. But those 10 years when I was out of it were the 10 years when what I should have been doing was becoming a millionaire, <laughs> of course. <laughs> those were the years, you know. I was happy, you know, it's okay, doing those woodblock prints, that 10-year poet series, you know. And because I was focusing on that, I said, Dave, don't get interested in that stuff. Leave it. Focus on what you're doing. Don't get sidetracked. And I did. I focused, focused, focused. For 10 years, I focused. How fast was my first modem? I have no idea what the specs were. It was a, an acoustic coupler, you know, the thing you put the, the telephone inside. I don't remember the specs at all. I'm sorry. I know nothing about that. So 300 baud, something like that, but I really I don't remember. I'm sorry. I'd love to hear that sound again. I guess you probably YouTube has the video with this sound. I, you know, you, you 
dial that hear the beep, put the thing in, and then there's all those the beeps back and forth. I haven't heard those in. There's probably YouTube videos. It was great fun, you know, just hunting great fun. <laughs> Once this block is finished, and this is now going to be really quite soon, we've got just the calligraphy left to go after these crane legs are done. The next step normally after the key block is finished would be to prepare color separations and color blocks, but that won't happen right away because this, this as I said, there's going to be sort of two key blocks for this print. There's the darker lines, and then as I said, the crows, or the, the body of the cranes are going to be embossed. But that's another kind of key block. So what I'll do is I'm going to be flipping this piece of wood over and using the other side, probably, perhaps, or maybe I'll be getting another block from upstairs, I'm not sure. But I'll be doing that carving first. So it'll be uh, carving this black block to completion then carving the shapes of the birds to completion. And then when those two are finished, I'll be combining those two blocks on printed sheets to do the color separations. And I've really got to get going on this because our printers want to start this next week. That's not gonna happen because I'm not gonna be finished next week, but they really want to get started on this. This is January's publications, which means we should be printing it during November. So I'm kind of behind the eight ball now. So that's why I took the last two days to do so much carving on this instead of doing it just on stream. How do I know how deep to cut the wood? It's, and we make the standard joke, you know, how long should a man's legs be? It's, it's, you know, it's just, whatever, when the lines are close together, your left cut and your right cut combine to pop the wood out. That determines how far you go down on areas between wider carved areas. We go down far enough that when you're printing, it doesn't leave marks. If this area here is too shallow, then it would leave marks on the printing paper. So that's basically the key. You go down just far enough so that you're below the level of the paper. Work your time, right? Nine o'clock. Okay. I asked Ishikawa-san to come down at 9.15, but almost certainly she's not going to show up. So, uh, you know.
あれデリブリー、What's we getting today here? あ,あどうもありがとうございます。あ,あどうもあ多めからですね。はいどうも。どうも。はい。どうも。はい。どうも。九。That's not an auction stuff or anything. That's the delivery from our Ome workshop. They're sending me stuff here. It's some wood blocks that I asked for. I have to send those to one of our printers. And it's,、uh, it may be stuff also for America. They're still packing for America. I'm shipping the FedEx boxes from here. So, I'm not, I'm not expecting any special auction stuff today or anything. So, how did I know it was a delivery? <laughs> It's, you know, in your own area, right? You're in your own room and you hear certain sounds. And I could hear. You saw the guy had a, maybe, did you see it in the, in, the, in the video there? He had a little green trolley, and it's got wheels and it's got brakes and stuff like that. And the, I heard him a couple of buildings up, and then he stopped outside this one, ka chunga, put his brake on. And I know it's nine o'clock, it's the takubin sound, so yes, here's a delivery. In, in your own home, you know what happens by the sounds. You know, there's the sound of a door closing, you know who's going on and what they're doing and stuff, you know. A soundscape, isn't it? Each place has its own soundscape, and that guy and his little buggy, he's part of a local soundscape. And we hear him twice a day for sure, and sometimes more often. He comes around at this time with the deliveries. Then he's got a pickup run. He comes between 4 30, it's not really time, he comes between about 4 30 and 5. And he brings his trolley around, stopping here and there at places where he knows s e n d a lot of packages. It's pre arranged. He comes here every day, seven days a week, at about 4 30. Not the same man, but the, the same company. And today, too, we will be sending today. There's two packages. We'll be leaving here today. I've got to get those packaged. So I'll be seeing him again, or another one of those guys, at about 4 30. It's an amazing system, you know. Their, their mornings are spent delivering the packages that were given to them yesterday, and their afternoons are spent picking up packages for the next day's delivery all over the country. You know. And anything I give to them by that time, by about five o'clock, as long as I give it to them by about five o'clock, it will be guaranteed it'll be at its destination tomorrow morning, anywhere in the country, anywhere except the small outlying islands. There's some islands that have like only ferry service or whatever once a day, and you know, they can't guarantee next day delivery. But as long as I get it ready for him before we close the shop or so at five o'clock, that's it. The person will have the package anywhere in this country the next morning. It's an insane system, absolutely insane. It's not the cheapest stuff in the world. Their base, base price now is, I think, about seven bucks or so just for the smallest package, but it gets there.
Quatre Skokies. Bon, je vais aller. Yeah, this one's kind of small. Yeah, it's not. It's, this is not microscopically small. We've carved much smaller than this before. But, um, and when we see those crabs coming up in the next one of the next show and tells, you'll see. This is small, but it's not. I don't know nothing dramatic. This is sort of all in the day's work. Today's stuff. This is not breathtaking levels of uh, of smallness. Today, after I'm done here, there's, uh, my priorities are going to be there's a couple of packages to prepare for the printers, send blocks and paper to a couple of printers. I've got to send finished prints to Olme. Some of the printers have turned in prints the last few days, and I've finished checking them. They have to be sent to our Olme shipping center, ready to be sent out to, uh, to, to clients. Then what I also have to do today, I can't postpone it anymore, is I have to get the design finalized, and I've got to get a, a hunch, a tracing ready, for our New Year's design this year, our New Year's card. And I'm really, really delinquent. This should have been done weeks ago, but uh, I didn't get to it. And it, today, absolutely, I cannot postpone any longer. Uh, the carving is gonna go to Taran, Taran Sam, Taran Casey. He won't be here today, he's, he's on the, he won't be on the stream today here. He's teaching English. But he's really waiting, and he's, uh, he's really, really waiting, because I'm late now. It's gonna put a bit of time pressure on him. Because ideally our printers want to do this like from next week, but uh, that obviously can't happen now because I've delayed so long. But, uh, but this should have been done weeks ago. So that's my priority today is the, the New Year's design. Now I've got the design in, in my mind. I know what we're going to be doing, but I have to get the data ready and uh, get it on paper and get it ready for Talon Sun to start carving. Ah, uh, John, you missed that one. <laughs> Getting old, are we? <laughs> yeah, Taransan, it's been a bit, you know, it's been a bit iffy. You know, I've been asking for a year or so to be able to send some work to him, but Asuka Sensei, his teacher, said no. We've talked about this before. It's, you know, I cannot hire Taransan directly to do this because he is the official apprentice of another workshop here. So of course, and I wasn't even supposed to talk to him, but we went around and went around and went around and we finally got a hold of Askasan on this and got his agreement. That, so this job for our New Year's card is gonna go to Askasan. He's gonna be the, the you know, guy running it. And of course the blocks are gonna go to Talan, Talan San for, for carving. And it's a bit dicey, you know, because Askasan is taking a risk here. Because if he sends it to Talan San to, for carving, and he does a, what he thinks is a good job, and Asuka-san thinks it's a good job, and they send it to me. And if I said, what is this crap, then it's real trouble. So we're, we already know this is not going to happen. I know he can do the level that I'll be asking him to do, and whatever comes, I'll say thank you very much, and we'll send it through. So I'm very careful of this, and I will not say anything or do anything that could possibly make trouble. Because I want this thing to go as smoothly as possible. I want that guy to be training, 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 and we want to be able to use him for work in the future. So. So he won't be here today, he's teaching English, but Talan San sometimes drops by on Saturday morning, and he may see this know, uh, during his lunch break or something, whatever. So, 
So if he, if, he, if he does Tavans, and if you do see this later today, I'm on it. Today will be the last day. The tracing should be ready tonight. I'll find a woodblock upstairs. Today's Thursday. It'll be in your hands very soon now, if you hear this later today. Now what we're going to do is, you know, last year's New Year's design was really not interesting. It had been in the same situation. I got myself in time pressure, I left it too long, and I came up with what I thought was a kind of an okay design, but it was really 100% as boring as they come. So this year... Domo! Ah, you been cooking? Arigato gozaimasu! Domo! Thank you! Domo! Thank you! That's the post office. I didn't know that was coming. And I can see, I know what these things are actually. One of them is a package of finished prints from Kubota-san, one of our printers who has finished a batch of work. And one is something from overseas. What are we expecting from overseas? What are we expecting from overseas? I don't remember. I don't know. How's our time? 9.14, it's time, it's time, it's time, it's time, it's time. Okay, tell you what, let's look at what Kubota-san said, because I think these are fun. One second. Yoisho, yoisho. What am I going to do now? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? It's from John Amos. It's from John Amos. I really want to show that to you. This is from Kubota-san. This would be so cool to show you. I've got Ishikawa-san's books. I told her I would show them today. Oh! Well, Kubota-san, sorry, out you go. That's just a bunch of, I know, that's just a bunch of our normal prints. Oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Ah. That garbage truck is late, right? He's normally here like at 8.30. Okay, I promised Ishikawa-san I would show these, so let's do this. I promised Ishikawa-san I would show these. John Amos's package, you know what this is, right? Somebody got a link for this? John, John Becker, you know what this is, right? John Amos, his book, Appalachian Trail. Stop wasting time. Hi, hi, hi. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. This is the book. This is the book. Where's the link? This is not woodblock prints. It's an offset printed book combining the text of these are the woodblock prints. These Ishikawa-san does not sell. She made these herself over the past couple of years. And this is funny. I knew she was making stuff like this, but I didn't know to what extent she was making stuff like this. These are, ha the cover is hand carved, hand printed. Every page is hand carved, hand printed. It's a story, she's called herself On, book and picture by On. And they are Yuchin Zoshi, Maki no Ichi. This is, Yuchin is the dog's name, Zoshi is a uh, picture book, and Maki no Ichi is book one, a uh, uh, story and pictures by On, which is her, her handle name. And the, her pet, the, the Yuchin has passed away now. He passed away 
a year and a half ago, I guess, a year and a half ago. But uh, he was really a family member. And she went, she just, whatever, she, she made these books and they are just so cool. This is, they, we don't, she doesn't sell these. This is nothing, I'm not showing you this that you can buy it or whatever. I just want to show you the books she made for herself, for her family member. Everything you see there is carved. This is not a repeated pattern, printed, 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 printed. She carved the head once, twice, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, 12 times she, she carved the face. Hand printed, hand carved, everything you see here. Now it's not a full color book. She did the front page in color and the rest is in black and white. And all the text, she has also carved all the text. You've seen me do this before, but she's done this. So a very loved doggo, absolutely a very loved doggo. And the stories are not, uh, they're just episodic, you know, whatever. The, 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 she describes her house, the dog waits for her when they come home and stuff like this. And they're, they're a little bit simplistic. Oops, wrong way. And again, she doesn't sell these. She doesn't sell them at all. She sells the book, the one I linked together, the, 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 the hard, she made a hardcover version in Offset, which has the text of all these things, the contents of all these things, but it's not woodblock printed. These are the handmade woodblock prints. I thought what we should do is let's get one of these. I like the one about the trains, and I'd like to go through it together, and uh, it's all in Japanese, but I'll translate as we go through. Is that okay? Have you got time for this? We're okay. Let's do this. This is, I know, she's printed this on non-sized paper, and what she's done is you can see there's deep color, medium color, light color, and it's fuzzed out on the edges to give an effect of dropping ink on water. She, this, lady, this lady is having fun with this, you know. Let's go through this. Can we, can we, can we, what's the right angle to do this? I'm going to be able to read this myself. Out for the walks, you chan up. Is he, is he, is he, you know, is this a dog, a uh, train loving dog? It is the evening walk. Dog is sniffing, dog is sniffing, the usual stuff that dogs do on an evening walk. You get to a corner. Yu Chan wants to move in the direction of the station. That's the station. And he's pulling, and she's saying, No, Yu Chan, so chio, let's go this way. This way is to go home. No, he wants to go to the station. She wants to go home. So she's, All right, okay, we do this every day. I give up, I give up. Let's go to the station. They get near the front of the station. This dog's tail is wagging, wagging, wagging. He's really, really happy to get to the station. And here he is at the gate. Now, she hasn't drawn all the thousands of people coming by, but what she's given here is the text, what the people walking through are saying. Ah, oh, what a cute dog. Oh, kawaii. He's a shibu. Is he, I know, shiba -san. Is he waiting for his father? You know, like the famous dog at Hachiko. So the dog is standing here while the people are pouring out, all making wonderful comments. Oh, what a cute dog, what a wonderful dog, blah, 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 blah. And the number one comment is, oh, you must be waiting for, you know, the mister to come home, are you? So she's thinking, does he like trains? What's going on? Does he, he really wants to be here at the station. Does he like trains? So she says, okay, let's tell you what, today for a special treat, let's go inside and I'll let you finally see the trains. So they go inside and they're on the platform and she can hear it. Oh, Yu Chan, I can hear the train, it's coming. And he's looking the other way. So here we go, the train comes around the corner. It's here, yo, she says, it's here, it's here. He's still looking the other way. We get to the thing, the train's coming. She says, the train's here, look, look, look. Here's the train, he's just not interested. She's like, what's this, you got no interest? What's going on with this? They get back out to the front. She's here, nani, 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 what's going on? What's going on, what's going on? And then she realizes, ah, moshikaste. It's probably, and there he is, back out at the front door of the station, and again, surrounded by all these comments. What a wonderful dog, what a beautiful dog, kawaii, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. This is why the dog likes going to the station. Not because he's interested in trains, but because when he stands there, everybody stands telling him what a wonderful, fabulous dog. So here we are, the next day's sample, here we are. Dog is, look, station, 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 let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> They're just episodes. It's not great literature, it's nothing whatever, but she's hand carved and hand lettered every single one of these things. So there we are, that's a fun show and tell. And for the promotion part of this, she does have a book, and we've now put it on our catalog so anybody who's interested can get this. It's unfortunate, this is not hand carved and printed, of course, but there we are. 
And I wanted her to come down and just sit here and let me talk to her about how she does this and stuff, but no, she is just way, way, way too shy on this. The other thing about this is, I had known she was making her own prints, because I've seen, she, she went to Asuka-san's Takumi workshop to, to learn something about carving and printing. So I know she had a print each year in one of their exhibitions. But then once there was a time, I don't know, five, six, seven months ago, whatever, I went upstairs one day, and I opened the door to go in the printer's room, and she sort of, like that, that when you go into a kid's room and they try and hide something, like, like they don't want you to see it, the teachers come into the room, you know. And I'm like, what's wrong? And she says, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, 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 and she was working on one of these. She said, I'm working on my own project. And she had thought that I would be not so cool with this. She's here working upstairs as a printer, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I, what, are you, what are you talking about? Her work, one, her work here, she gets paid by what she finishes. So she finishes 100 prints, she gets paid for 100 prints. Takes her one week, two weeks, three weeks. That's not my problem, that's her problem. So it's irrelevant to me if she's doing other work other than my work. And the second is, this is not a bug for me, it's a feature. I want the people here to be interested in prints and to do other stuff and to dig in and make their own projects. And So of course I told her, she goes, on, don't even... Don't even, don't even. But still now, she still, she can't throw that off, even though intellectually she understands Dave says it's okay, it's all right. But still, when I go up, she, she apologizes, oh, well, I'm still working on this. <laughs> I just laugh at her and laugh at her and laugh at her. <laughs> So she's got an Instagram. I don't know the Insta. If somebody knows it, please feel free. Post it in here. Punch it in here. <coughs> so this is just for me. This is just plus, plus, plus. The thing is, though, you know, it's funny. The dog has passed away, oh, it's uh, at least a year and a half ago so now. And these were the first four she did. And at the end of the fourth one, there's a note about this. In fact, you can see it in here. At the end of the fourth one, which we see here, there's a note mentioning this, that the dog spent his last year or so in diapers and he passed away at 17 and a half years old and there it is. And that sort of would have finished it, but she's doing more. She's got volume five already finished, it's upstairs, and she's this week, she's working on the printing on volume six. And David intellectually finds that a little bit disturbing. I guess this was a family member, it was a wonderful pet, but two and a half, a year and a half after it's passed away, to still be making this book series continuing, I don't know. Do I do the same thing with Boots Chan? Boots Chan is gone now for nearly 10 years, I guess, I guess. And I still talk about Boots Chan, but I wouldn't, you know, whatever. I wouldn't. Um, I don't, Jap speaking generally, Japanese people speaking generally, and Westerners like me speaking generally, there's a very different approach to this question of pets at the end of life, you know, with us, I know, with us, again, I'm speaking very generally, my culture, if a pet can no longer walk around, can no longer eat, uh, and if there's any doubt about it at all, if it's in pain, you know what we do, we, you know, gently slide it away, but the, that almost never happens in Japan. For them, it's inconceivable that anybody would do such a thing, and I got in trouble with Ishikawa-san. This would be some years ago when she, we talked about the, the pets, and she had mentioned the situation, not eating and diapers and stuff like this. And I had mentioned, when are you going to take to the vet? And she got so upset. It's a very, very big cultural difference, you know. Very big cultural difference. Difficult situation to talk about. Difficult, difficult. There's no rules. You should do this. It's impossible to say such a thing. Each of us has our own emotions and feelings. On top of that, there are general cultural situations that people accept when they hear what their neighbors are doing, you know. But this is one of those things where this culture is very, very, very different from the culture in which I grew up. And I've learned now, just keep quiet. It's none of my business what other people do about this. So, so. Anyway, there you are, a little introduction for Ishikawa-san's books. I'm really happy that she's making these. It's really great fun that she's making these. And it's, for me, it's a win, 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 win situation. So. It's 9.30. I can't, we have got to do this. If any of you want to go home, you go home, that's fine. I myself really want to see this, and this is super, super interesting. It's a little bit, one tiny bit of, of bad timing here. This is also a handmade book, just like Ishikawa-san's handmade books. But Ishikawa-san is sort of doing that as a nice little, uh, 
as a nice little hobby for herself. This is John Amos, who is a professional woodblock printer. I guess he's a professional. He's actually a university professor, but, but whatever, uh, the level of work. John is a professional. He's been here to look at our work. He's not my student. John is a full 100% independent. He's done the same thing that I did. Got interested in this and just studied and worked and studied and worked and studied and worked. And without wanting to criticize anybody else, there's lots of people who talk about making prints, who think they'd like to be a printmaker, who, well, yeah, that would be so cool, talk, 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 talk. John is a doer. He's a 100%, 100% doer. He's being polite here, he's being kind. Without your guidance, I couldn't have imagined doing it. That's a nice thing to say, but John didn't need me at all. I just happened to have been first in making my own prints and doing stuff. I'm 10 years older than John, so I was here first. That's the only advantage I've got. John himself is not my student and doesn't need me. Anyway, so, has somebody got a link for this? You're already up on me. John Amos, university professor in Georgia, self-taught printmaker, Big hiker, he's done the Appalachian Trail in total 100 times or whatever, I don't know the details on that. He's combined his two loves of hiking and of printmaking. He's combined his love of Shin Hunger Prints. He's, a, he's a, an acolyte of Yoshida Hiroshi, and his prints very much show uh, Yoshida Hiroshi influence, which he very much recognizes. He bound the books himself, so he's made all the parts, he's done the string, everything you are going to see, everything, 100% is conceived, created, and executed by John. And he is a super, you think I'm a control freak? This guy makes me look like an absolute beginner. John is insane. I say that in a, in a absolute, full of respect way. John is insane. And he's gonna leave behind himself a fabulous, fabulous body of work. I haven't seen this before. I, I, all I know is that it's a book of his prints they are outlining the trail, the Appalachian Trail, explanation of what it is. And here we go, and he's put the prints in. And the idea is, he wants to make this accessible. He knows Westerners are gonna display prints on the wall. He knows himself that's not the best way to do this, but he wants to play it both ways. So the prints are here. They're put in the folder in a loose format. They're in loose corners. So you can take them out, put them in a frame, and put them back in. I told him, you know what this is gonna mean? Copies of this book are gonna be found down the, down the road with one print missing because it's in a frame. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Now, I have not seen these before. I knew he was making this project, but he doesn't have big websites with step-by-step -step of every print going on. So I am gonna very quietly and peacefully later this afternoon go through this book and drink in all these prints. They're very much a Shin Hanga, and I guess we've got the trail. I know, just a minute, just skip back to it here. It's trail marker at the bottom, and there's a print from each of many locations all the way up the trail. All carved on blocks that John made the blocks himself. He's made his own barren himself. This guy is legally, clinically insane. A fabulous, fabulous collection. Absolutely fabulous collection. He hasn't done it the same way I would do it, but that's okay, that's nothing to do with me. John is his own man. Some of these prints, maybe not all of them, I don't know, some of them, where you find things like earth textures, he has done things like he's gone over to the trail, scooped around to find a particular nice kind of clay that would uh, make pigments with us. So he has made some of these prints with pigment clay from the actual trail itself. You can, each one of these, look, I can, when I look at each one of these, I can think, ah, oh, that Hasri print, that Goyo print, that's Hasri print. Am I gonna take him out of this folder? I'm gonna chat with John about this. So I presume John is a sensible guy. I would imagine he has used acid-free paper here to hold these in. It's probably no worse than what I would be holding them in myself. The main thing about this is that as long as it's looked at, if it's aired once in a while, and if it's on paper that is not a dangerous paper, then we're good to go on this. 
the rain here, it looks like John hasn't carved it out. It looks like he's done this with, it might be gofun powder, it might be mica powder. It looks like it might be mica powder. I don't know, we'd have to ask him for sure. And the white here is printed on top. Oh, look at this, where have we seen this before? Yoshida's Grand Canyon. And I don't say that with any sarcasm, of course. John is uh, influenced by Hiroshi Yoshida, and I'm sure he says this is basically a, an homage to Hiroshi Yoshida. And he's doing what, you know, what, what craftsmen here do, or, or even designers here used to do in the old days. You join somebody's studio, and you spend your first couple of decades copying exactly what they are doing. Then as you yourself get more mature and more experience, then your own taste starts to come out into things. So in John's early years, which we are here, we are still seeing a lot of Hiroshi Yoshida. And year by year by year, bit by bit, we will see more John Amos coming out as time goes by. And it's the light, the light, the light. So many of these are all about the light. What's the retail value of this book? It's on the website, he sells it now. I think it's 700, uh, I forget the number, $780. John Amos, A-M-O-S-S. -S. And if somebody else can pop the link directly to his shopping cart. I think, I don't see numbers here. And I think what John's doing with this, or has he numbered the book? I honestly don't know, is this a limited edition or not? Oh, he's limited the book. But the prints themselves are not numbered, so I assume that he's going to keep making these as time goes by. I hope so, but that's, that's my own, I don't know. And when you think of the amount of labor that's gone into this thing, making the wood blocks, planing them, designing them, going out there, figuring the designs, tracing, doing the key blocks, doing the color blocks, printing yourself, the amount of labor that's involved here, that price is just a joke. It's an absolute joke. I myself, I'm not thinking, wow, 750 right now, it's a bit much, but later this is gonna be worth tens of thousands of dollars. I don't know that, I don't care that, I'm not thinking about that, I don't care. He has done something I really am a little bit disappointed with. You can see emboss marks here where the Baron has touched from other wood blocks. He maybe was printing the mountain here and the Baron touched an area outside. I saw that here, it's on almost every one of those. And I'm personally, I'm a bit disappointed. And that shows me that John is not using much of a side light to look at his prints. He's maybe framing them, putting them in a flat light. So Dave personally finds that bothersome and, bo and annoying, but this is not my call. No, it wasn't a gift. I'm, I'm supporting John's work. We went to his shopping cart, bang, we ordered it. In fact, we ordered it a long, long time ago, but he didn't want to ship because of the, uh, the shipping problems back and forth between America. No, I wouldn't have asked John as a gift. No way. The guy is trying to make it. Let's support the work, absolutely. Another one here in this corner too. That's really disappointing for me. And he must have seen it. He signed it. So he doesn't care about those marks. John's idea, I guess, is it's all about the image. He's also, compared to us, he's left huge wide margins. This is very much a, a modern Western thing, ready for framing in a big wide frame with a big wide map. Again, personally not my taste, but this is not nothing to do with me. What would, I believe he used American cherry for the most part. He, he's made it maybe, <coughs> he probably imported wood from Japan for the first print or the first few prints he was doing in this style. Quickly realized it wasn't going to be economically feasible and also the, the quality was really not so good. So he began to make his own, his own wood blocks. And if you look up the Tanuki blog, I don't have a link for it here, but he has many blog posts explaining and showing how he physically made the wood blocks used for these prints. John is very much interested in showing and telling and showing and telling. He's got no secrets. He will happily show everybody how he has done these things. A 
I guess these are real locations. I suppose they're probably uh, you know, shown pretty much as they are. I don't think there's much artistic distortion here. I'm sure these are real locations. And I haven't been tracking this, but have we seen a mix of different seasons, I guess? I don't know. I haven't been uh, following. It's so much fun. The influences you see here on these things. So much fun. I can go back. It's, this is Hiroshi Yoshida, page 43, and stuff like this. <laughs> I, again, that's not an insult. It's just recognizing John's got clear influences here, and he is going to work in that milieu and then go beyond it. And this must be the end. So this must be the mile marker at the end of this thing. Look at this. Look at this. I can see the struggles here, you know. Absolutely, I can see the struggles here. Yeah, they, I'm, I, haven't, I haven't been showing you each book. Uh, let's zoom out then. What we've been, each, each print is, of course, paired with information here. The prints and the information sheets are side by side. I don't know if he sketches or takes photos. I don't know. I mean, he, I presume he took a million pictures when he was hiking. <coughs> so I, I suppose these, these things probably, maybe they're taken from a photograph combined with you know, sketching. I really don't know. I don't care. There's clearly a depiction of a real place, so whether you use photographic you know, assistance to help you put it together, that's fine by me, you know. What a wonderful treasure, absolute wonderful treasure. I'm so happy to have got this. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Cheap at twice the price. Cheap at five times the price. Wonderful. Okay, there you go. I'm a bit sad for Ishikawa-san. <laughs> it's okay. There are different kinds of things here. It's different kinds of stuff. No problem. But this was book day. Handmade book day here on, on the on a Twitch stream show and tell. Handmade book day. Again, you know, if you just if you Google John Amos and Google this book, it'll come up. It's, he's got a website for it. And he sells it over the website. I have no idea how many he's got left. I know nothing about it. it was, we didn't plan this uh, page as a promotional day here, but uh, there it is. If somebody finds this interesting, absolutely, there's a link. Thank you very much again. Okay, guys, what is it now? It's Thursday. <clears throat> I'll be back here in two more days. Now, this block you're looking at, the the chicken legs, that's probably going to be finished maybe tonight or tomorrow. So the next stream, perhaps, is where I'll be maybe starting the fresh carving on the next block, the block where we carve the bodies of all those birds in, in Karazuri. Not so sure. Anyway, we'll be doing one thing or the other. Okay. Hey, really good. I got a bunch of work done today. I'm very happy to show you nice, neat stuff. Thanks to John for, for doing this and for making this. I am now out of here. Tom 1060, it's here. It's by my side. We have crabs waiting, waiting. Crabs coming soon to a website near you. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you very much. See you next time. <laughs>